This video is about the continuing role that housing plays as a base to receive care and improve health outcomes for persons living with HIV AIDS. Fortunately for many, the advances of HIV treatments allow participants to better manage their health and address HIV as a chronic condition. Unfortunately, for persons in unstable housing situations, especially those who are homeless, access to this care is not easy to maintain. And with AIDS, issues of discrimination, stigma, and poor connections to health remain tremendous barriers. This program is to help you consider what can be done in your community to broaden our caring networks. It is also to promote ways to break down these barriers for disadvantaged households. The National HIV AIDS Strategy recognizes the importance of stable housing as a cornerstone to enable effective participation in treatment for persons living with HIV. The strategy notes how HIV infection tends to disproportionately affect the same populations most impacted by forms of housing discrimination. Those households who are poor, of minority, sexual, or gender identity groups, and or those who are racial or ethnic minorities. There are also other barriers for persons with substance abuse issues, mental illness, and past records of incarceration. Under the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a number of programs can provide this space in making housing affordable. One special program is the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS program. HOPWA uniquely targets affordable housing with links to comprehensive services in order to meet the complex needs of low-income persons living with HIV AIDS. Along with HUD's homeless assistance and community development efforts, these housing programs rely on the community to plan, operate, and evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of the programs. If not already involved, I encourage you to learn more about participating in these efforts. There is also much work to do in educating Americans about HIV and AIDS. To avoid the stigma and risk and to improve the helping hands of care. Your learning and teaching will be of great help to change the fear and stigma associated with HIV and fight discrimination in all sectors of life and work. This year, in our collaborations under the National HIV AIDS Strategy, one large city reported that over 40% of persons who know the HIV diagnosis are not in care. Why? Because of stigma and discrimination and the fear of letting others know that they are living with the challenges of HIV. You don't have to suffer alone. By working in partnerships, including federal and local governments, our faith-based and community institutions can help end stigma and denial. This, in turn, will reduce the associated delay in accessing treatment, which is so vital to successfully addressing HIV. Today, faith-based institutions can add new voices and ensure that we build a more comprehensive and compassionate response to HIV AIDS. The video you are now watching features a number of exciting local initiatives and approaches to broadening our response to HIV disease. You will hear from many on how to take the next practical steps and the urgency to do so, to go about affirming persons and saving lives. This is the title of a national age-appropriate curriculum developed by the United Church of Christ which is now available free on the internet. You will also learn about how to find their education tools that you can use in your neighborhood to seek, to share, and to help those in such great need. The Roundtable Symposium, from which the following presentations were taken, was a collaboration between HUD's Office of HIV AIDS Housing, HUD's Baltimore Field Office, HUD's Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, the White House, other federal agencies, along with beneficiaries, clients, 
advocates, and service providers. Please join us in affirming persons and saving lives. Thank you. I wanted to ask the question, why are we here? Why would you come to a meeting like this? Now, first of all, I know, and I thank the panelists who are going to be speaking. We know you know a lot about what can be done in community, and we really are privileged that you have agreed to speak to us today. I know my colleagues in the other parts of uh, the department. We also started to know that it's not one office, it's not just one thing, it's how the whole thing works. And so in, in addition to the different parts of HUD represented here today, the other parts of the federal government, HHS, uh, labor, justice, uh, veterans affairs, and importantly, the White House, which uh, we're going to hear something about the national aid strategy and, and, and what that means for us to do more. And I think you're here today, too, because you know that we need to do more. The issues of poverty and homelessness are now linked with HIV. And if we don't delink them and get people with HIV in stable housing and stable life situations, it's going to be devastating for them, and it is still for too many. And we can do something about that because we know so much about some of the solutions. We know that if you manage this, it can be a managed health crisis, a managed health situation, and better life outcomes for our clients. And so housing is really an important part of that, and I want to thank you for agreeing to be part of that discussion. Um, I don't How do you do yeah, just go like this. Okay. Well, the, there's the copies of this PowerPoint on your desk. So I won't go through all of it. But the real message is housing is part of the solution. And if we can help people get out of unstable situations, we can link them to care and make them participate in care in a significant way. Uh, another aspect of this is disparities. So much about the issues of AIDS and poverty and homelessness is about disparities in our communities, and you know that in your own community. It's people who are not getting into care or staying in care in a meaningful way, retaining care. That's an important challenge for us. And I, one thing that uh, really struck me, um, I guess I'm hitting the wrong button. Get forward. I got it. In talking with Dr. Fauci, this 30th year of AIDS, something he said that really struck me as important that, you know, first of all, we have science that tell, tells us what we can do. But when we look at treatment and care in this nation, only 19% of Americans living with HIV are getting optimal treatment with their viral loads completely suppressed. And so many are challenged just to access care in a way that is meaningful in the other parts of their lives, as I said, to find stable housing, to link to services as needed, to be reunited to family. Um, the other aspect of today's discussion is about the uh, the other challenges. HIV is also linked to stigma, discrimination, misunderstanding, fear, prejudice, and all those things that prevent people from getting care. And we can do something about that. So in meeting with our Assistant Secretary Mercedes Marquez, who would send her, re her remarks to, she asked our two offices, the faith-based office and my office of HIV AIDS housing, what can we do together that would help promote understanding, that would promote better results? And we decided that we try to outreach to our neighbors and our communities to do something. And one thing that those of us at headquarters are trying to learn, and we're not yet there yet totally, is that it's not here in Washington, but it's in the cities and the states and communities and neighborhoods where it happens. So we're so privileged that our Baltimore field offices have joined us. Because it's not us at HUD, it's you and your community accessing our resources, accessing other resources to make a difference in your own community. And even if you don't actually run one of our programs, you can actually be really important to us as we do that collaboration and, and, and work to uh, get the results and improve the results over time. And, and as Carol said, just get, do something, get started. And what we can do at HUD is we can pay for rental assistance. We can help develop community residences. We can help make sure they are continuing. We can help make sure that they link to services. We can help with community planning and helping your organizations understand the challenges. We can provide technical assistance. And we can help work with you on service coordination. And what you can do with us, even if you don't run these programs for us, is you can help connect clients to care. Because it isn't just about programs and government. It's about the human aspect. And so much about the faith-based um, work that has taught me in my work in uh, managing programs 
is that sometimes people don't connect to care. And it's often the faith community that helps those people get through that connection, helps them understand that the road to recovery is, is available, and helps them and keeps them on the path to recovery. As much as a scientist, I am so happy to see public health as the framework for all that's going on here at HUD. I just said to Ms. Massey that if HUD can implement what it already put in place, we will see huge impact on the issue of HIV AIDS, not only for the HUD served community, but for the larger population across the United States. So I really applaud you for the work that you're doing. In public health, we have these words that we throw around that people like to use, social determinants of health, which just says exactly what Tim talked about, context matter, Jeff talked about it. Uh, people have behaviors that have impact, but where you live, what you do, what that environment is like, both in terms of the social environment, the physical environment, the economic environment, has an impact on people's health and well-being. And we're not just talking about the physical health, we're talking about mental, emotional health, which is critical to overall health and well-being. So I'm happy to see that's on the table. And the other term we like to use is health equity. So we talked about the unequal distribution of health, and we know that's not a random effect, and that's something we can do something about, and I'm happy to see HUD and its partnership doing that. And then our third kind of big frame that we love is community engagement, and that is written all over what HUD is doing. Without engaging the community that you're attempting to serve, you will have no impact. So having HUD, HHS, faith-based institutions, other organizations, the economic sector, the uh, science sector all come to play to bring this into problem solving, I believe you have quite an effective model. Is housing essential for persons affected by HIV AIDS? Seems obvious, right? Seems obvious. And I put that up there deliberately um, because I guess for many of us who work in public health or work in housing, this seems sort of an obvious answer. Um, in a second, I'm going to review some of the research because for some of us, uh, maybe not in this room, it's not so obvious, or it's not on the radar screen. And so I think it doesn't hurt for us to really take, a, take stock of why it is we say it's essential, what, is the re, 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 what does the research say, and what do we know in our gut intuitively of why housing is important. Secondly, I use the word affected, because um, the outstanding, outstanding programs like HOPLA and others who support people who are infected with HIV is critically important, but we also must not forget those who are at risk. I mean, there's, there's the, the, the two-sided coin here, um, that housing stability, housing security is important for those at risk and for those who are infected. So what do we know? <clears throat> there's a growing consensus among HIV AIDS experts that HIV prevention strategies will not succeed without attention to structural factors. And when we think about sort of addressing the person holistically, and we've seen campaigns about wearing condoms or getting tested, and all that's all critically important, but I think we understand uh, more that uh, the, addressing the issues of HIV AIDS risk and HIV AIDS uh, treatment and care require also many other factors. Um, looking at uh, substance uh, issues, we're looking at mental health issues, looking at poverty, looking at stigma as we've, we've begun to address. All of that is critically important, and housing is right up there with them. And, and, and going through some of this, I should, I should say at the onset that this is both in terms of uh, how housing, or the, I should say the lack of housing, um, can be a detriment to health outcomes, but also what the benefits are when housing is there, when stable housing is there. Homeless or unstably housed persons are two to six times more likely to use hard drugs, share needles, or engage in high-risk sex than stably housed persons. Among persons already disproportionately impacted by HIV AIDS, men who have sex with men, persons of color, homeless youth, IV drug users, et cetera, lack of stable housing has a significant independent impact on HIV risk behaviors and rates of infection. Over time, persons who improve their housing status risk, reduce risk behaviors by half, while persons whose housing status worsens are four times as likely to increase risk through activities such as sex exchange. 
proven HIV risk reduction interventions, including counseling, needle exchange, and other behavioral interventions are less effective among persons who are homeless, unstably housed, than among those with housing. Housing improves access and adherence to antiretroviral medications. Compared to stably housed persons living with HIV AIDS, homeless persons living with HIV AIDS experience worse overall physical and mental health are more likely to be hospitalized and use emergency rooms, have lower CD4 counts and higher viral loads, are less likely to receive and adhere to antiretroviral therapy. Housing status is a stronger predictor of health outcomes than individual characteristics such as gender, race, ethnicity, or age, drug and alcohol use, and receipt of social services. Access to housing enables persons living with HIV AIDS to get into care and stay in care. Over time, housing status is among the strongest predictors of timely entry into HIV care. Persons living with AIDS who are homeless at the time of AIDS diagnosis are significantly more likely to die over a five-year period after controlling for medical status and other individual characteristics. Improved housing status also has a significant impact on mental health status and is associated with improvements in depression, perceived stress, and other mental health indicators. There's emerging evidence that shows that outcomes from housing interventions improve with quality housing and in the case of supporting housing with adequate on-site services, including support with adherence to HIV therapies. The unique nature of HIV disease makes housing an especially effective intervention. In particular, HIV disease combines an infectious agent, potentially fatal consequences, rapid spread in a vulnerable population, and the potential for development of drug-resistant strains. Both the HIV epidemic and homelessness in the United States are concentrated among persons marginalized by race, gender, abandonment, criminal justice involvement, mental illness, substance use, and violence and abuse. Among those persons at highest risk, housing status is increasingly identified as a determinant of health outcomes. And there are several studies that have shown that the effects of housing and HIV risk in health outcomes are greater for African Americans than for any other racial ethnic group. A, a lack of stable housing is a significant barrier to uh, highly active antiretroviral treatment. Use among persons recently released from incarceration with homelessness strongly associated with a lack of heart use. An ongoing study of United States veterans living with HIV shows that 44% have experienced homelessness and 11% are currently homeless, homeless and HIV infected veterans who have experienced homelessness are more likely than those who have not, been, who have not, who have not yet to be hospitalized. Studies consistently find strong, strong connections between housing instability, HIV risk, and victimization. And I would say, I'm, I'm going to stop there, there's so much more in terms of the, the research and evidence, and, um, but I, I do think it's important to remind ourselves why we do this, why the connection exists, and also to make sure that our public and, and private sectors who are, who are making decisions around this fully understand what the connection is. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, um, and some of this I don't have to go over, thankfully, because Alexia and, 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 and Jeff covered um, adequately. But yes, there is a national, strategy, national strategy that was released last year. Um, our office, the Office of HIV AIDS Policy, is uh, charged with doing a lot of the coordination um, with other departments, other agencies. Um, and um, we are really uh, uh, going full tilt now in um, putting together any number of consultations. Uh, we've had uh, several so far. The White House has had some. Other departments who are represented here can, can uh, talk to their uh, consultations. 
dealing with uh, the LGBT community, the PLWHA community, um, et cetera. Um, priorities, I'm gonna skip that for now. Um, recently, there was a congressional briefing um, that I attended, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but the question came up, do we still need HAPWA in the wake of recent advances in medical treatment? Again, interactive to you? Yeah. Well, why is that? Well, why is that? And the person who asked this question was someone who is concerned about housing and concerned about HIV. So this was not a question sort of said just out of, you know, indifference. Um, housing is, what do we know? Well, housing is expensive. Um, the dedicated resources that we have for um, HOPWA and other, and other um, HIV AIDS programs are important. Um, HIV AIDS is not another mere chronic condition. I, I, I particularly include this because um, we've been hearing a lot more about how HIV AIDS is just another chronic condition that people can manage. But as we've learned and have talked about already this, 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 this afternoon, the associated stigma, the restrictions um, that stigma produces in terms of the behaviors of people around testing, seeking employment, accessing housing, et cetera, makes it uh, other than just a chronic condition. I know my time is running short. Um, Alexia pointed out how we are working together on the Office of HIV AIDS Policy and the faith centers within uh, HHS and others have been, have been meeting and we've begun to uh, discuss ways in which we may collaborate further and encourage faith communities to get involved. Um, it's good to have David Voss here. We have been meeting as um, a collaborative group with many of the other uh, federal uh, departments who are charged with impl implementing the national strategy, including um, Department of Justice, Department of Labor, VA, et cetera. And we're working on exploring other ways in which um, collaboration um, is necessary. And of course, housing uh, jumped out as a central beginning point. Um, yes, the national strategy makes specific reference to the importance of the intersection of housing and, 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 and HIV AIDS. Um, and others will speak to that, I'm sure, later. Um, the role of faith-based institutions, significant potential for houses of worship and faith communities to influence attitudes about HIV AIDS and people living with or at risk of contracting HIV AIDS, as well as behaviors and decision making related to HIV testing and accessing quality care, as Alexia also pointed out. Um, the, the faith centers are, are have, I, I, as we mentioned, doing some great work here and beginning to um, uh, work collabor collaboratively with other departments. Um, some reflections and recommendations. Um, we must continue to refine and, and disseminate our research to better understand how and why housing and other supports are essential to ending the U.S. epidemic. Uh, must retain programs and policies that support and expand the housing options for persons living with HIV AIDS. And must continue to explore new and creative ways to uh, keep PLWHAs and high-risk persons stably housed. Um, uh, with, um, specifically with regard to HIV AIDS, you must increase awareness and education about HIV AIDS, must address HIV AIDS related stigma and discrimination, um, must have an appreciation of the real experiences, challenges and opportunities of persons living with HIV AIDS. We recently had a, uh, held a consultation uh, uh, meeting with folks uh, uh, living with um, HIV AIDS and I think it's always a good time to take stock again of what exactly are the real experiences um, of folks. Um, as they navigate um, our, our systems. Um, AIDS.gov was mentioned. I encourage you to go to it. Um, Miguel Gomez, who is director of AIDS.gov in our office, um, um, and they're doing a really terrific job of documenting what has gone on. Um, there, are some many, there are many blog posts that sort of summarize some of the key meetings and consultations and issues um, and other things going on. So it's a, it's a great sort of portal for uh, accessing information. Um, I whizzed through this, but um, if there are any questions or you want to further contact me, again, our office is really um, uh, heavily uh, charged with uh, doing much of the coordination um, at the, at the uh, federal level. And I encourage you to reach out to our office if you want more information. It is up there as 
is listed. Thank you. And, you know, sometimes when I'm asked to do things, I ask myself, Lord, why did they ask me? I don't have a lot of um, alphabet behind my name, so why do they ask me? But I think it's because I, I won't be quiet. You know, uh, we have to keep this issue in front of us. Let me just qualify uh, by saying I've lived HIV positive now for almost 18 years. And so I'm already blessed, right? Uh, I'm here to talk to you about a ministry called Positive Impact. That name came from our bishop and our co-pastor. Um, New Samaritan Baptist Church is led by Bishop Michael V. Kelsey Sr. and it's co-pastored by his wife, Sheila Bowens Kelsey, an elder. So about four years ago, I was working, no, actually a little better than that, a few years ago, I was working at University of Maryland, College Park, um, and I seemed to be doing more of New Samaritan's work than I was the university's work. So I had to come to this fork in the road and decide, okay, am I going to give these folks an a eight-hour day, you know, they're paying me, or am I going to go and do where my heart is leading me? So I decided to take this walk of faith. Not that I am independently wealthy, but it was just I had no peace until I did it. I let it be known that I was interested in working with HIV um, in faith environments, and I wanted to focus on women. That was selfish. It was smart, because that's what I knew about, too. Uh, having um, been infected uh, for, as I said, almost 18 years, and having experienced a lot of the things that go along with this disease, unfortunately, uh, I was an expert, and I am an expert. When we talk about the drivers for the disease, I've either experienced it or done it or been touched by it. So I'm not talking from a book. I'm talking from life experience. Um, anyway, I was such a bother that finally my bishop said, we're going to start an HIV ministry, Miss Massey, and I want you to lead it. Okay, so there we go. I knew that HIV was a huge issue in African American communities. I knew that because that's where I came from. I knew the fear around it. I knew the stigma involved in it because my brother passed away at age 35 from complications associated with being HIV positive and having AIDS. I knew what it did to families because I saw it almost paralyzed my mother um, in fear. And I saw it again when she realized that I was uh, diagnosed. So I knew that. I knew there was stigma. I knew people didn't talk about it because we called it cancer. We wouldn't call it HIV or AIDS. So I knew some things going in. I had spent some time while I lived in Philadelphia volunteering, you know, um, with a, a health corporation up there to represent community views and all that. So I was learning on the fly. Um, I joined the planning council in Baltimore where I still uh, volunteer. And I was learning. I made it a point whenever there was a conference or a meeting or a public forum to make sure that I was there. I needed to know. I couldn't purport to help other people if I didn't know myself. So we announced and launched this ministry in January of 2007. We had, as I shared with someone in the room, a long list of people who wanted to be a part of the HIV ministry. They had a warm, fuzzy feeling, or they had experienced something, or they had a heart to help. But when people found out we were not going to be baking any cakes and making any pies or doing the things that, you know, you usually think about ministries doing, at least when, that I think of, the list got a little shorter. First one they asked me was, um how has uh, uh, housing changed your life? Uh, uh, two, two things you need to know. Uh, one, the blizzard of 1996. Uh, and the other one is the prodigal son. And I'll tie them both together in just a minute. But anyway, the blizzard of 1996, I was in 
an abandoned car. Uh, I had no idea that the blizzard was coming. And when I went to bed, or when I laid down in that car, which was my bed, uh, I saw the ground. And when I woke up, uh, I couldn't open the door because it had snowed that much. And I had on tennis shoes. The prodigal son, if you know the story, you remember that in the end, when he was in the, with the pigs, and he was, you know, working with the pigs, he suddenly had what I call the aha moment. And he said, I'm going back to my father's house. When I woke up with that snow, I had that aha moment. You know, and we all have them. I mean, you, if, you, if you don't, you're not living. Because you always have these times in life where you say, how in the world did I get here? And that was the question I had to ask myself. How in the world did I get there? Well, in June of, of, of 96, um, I finally got housing. I, I got Hopwell housing, and it changed everything. Um, for one, being HIV positive and not being able to, to take your medicine. Uh, in, in 96, in the early 90s, when, when, the, when the medicines first came out, one of the things that you had to do was, it was three medicines. One you took once a day, one you took twice a day, one you took three times a day. Now try to do that and be homeless. It's not gonna work. So. I got healthier because I got pneumonia from bleeding that blizzard, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the other question was, was, would I still be alive if I hadn't got housing? And the answer would be no. I wouldn't be alive. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's hard being homeless by itself, but being homeless and having a compromised immune system is not going to work. Um, and what types of stigma or discrimination have you personally encountered? Uh, I remember when I first told my uh, daughter's mother that I was uh, HIV positive. And um, it's funny now. So, uh, but it wasn't too funny then, but it was, it's funny now. <laughs> But she, she, she walked around the house, she had these, these the rubber gloves on, and she had bleach in one hand and disinfected in the other hand. And every time I would go use the bathroom, she would rush in the bathroom and wipe everything down that I used, and she had this plate, and this was my plate, and she put it up here on the shelf, and you know, and, and, and one, day I, <laughs> one day I got tired. So what I did was I would go in the bathroom and I would turn the water on, I would turn the water off, and I would come out and she would run right in the bathroom and start cleaning everything. <laughs> you know, and then I would do the same thing again and we did, we played this game the whole day. <laughs> Seriously, this, this went on <laughs> all day. And finally, but, but it, what it did do, it sparked a conversation. And that was the thing that 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 changed her opinion because you know a lot of people discrimination is just plain ignorance. People just don't know. Uh, uh, and it says, what other examples of, or stigma of discrimination are you aware of that others suffered? Um, I'm also on a board um, uh, of directors for. Uh, quality of life, and quality of life is uh, a retreat for people who are HIV positive. Not only am I on the board of director, I am a director for one of the retreats. And so people call me and say, are you still got room on the retreat? Can I come to the retreat and all that? But one that, 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 that sticks in my mind more than anything else was this guy called me from uh, Charlotte, West Virginia. And he said, he said, Mr. Coley, I, I you know, I, I don't care how much it costs, please have a spot for me. 
because I can't talk to anybody down here. These people down here don't understand. I can't even go to the doctor and tell my doctor that I'm positive uh, because they just don't get it. They will ridicule me. Can I please come to this retreat? And of course, I, I said yes, and he came. Um, and, 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 he, and he cried most of the retreat. But there wasn't so much tears of, 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 of sorrow. It was tears of joy because he finally got around people that he could relate to and he could understand and people that understood him. And that made all the difference. And as a matter of fact, we still talk today. Uh, that was almost 10 years ago. Um, but that... But that, that kind of discrimination still goes on from time to time. I mean, well, not from time to time. It goes on a lot. Um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a NAC board member. And um, as a NAC board member, one of the things that I have learned, one of the things that I've known uh, through being a board member is that uh, health care is housing, and housing is health care. You can't expect a person to get well if they have no place to get well at. And, and, and you can't expect uh, um, anybody uh, to be better or get better if they have nowhere to go at night. It's hard. Trust me, I've been there and did it. <laughs> um, and how can uh, public, uh, public get greater involved in HIV housing and facilitate. Um, that's a, go to the NAC, the National AIDS Housing Coalition website, please. I implore you. Uh, go there, become a member. Why, you might ask. Why, you might ask. Um, because one, NAC is one of the four forerunners that goes to Congress, uh, Nancy Bernstein and her staff, they go to Congress on a regular. They there all the time. They know who got dollars, who don't have dollars, who's supporting housing, who's not supporting housing. And when they need your voice, because that's what runs Congress is our voice. Is our, our voice is what, what tells Congress what to do. If they don't hear from us, then they think everything is hunky-dory and not that not, that's not necessarily always true. So please go visit the website. In September, we're having a summit in New Orleans. Um, and you were talking about um, John Hopkins. I um, forgot the guy's name again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> see, I know. Uh, pe uh, he'll, he'll, he, he's been greatly involved in the summit. And, and, and you'll get a lot of information about um, uh, research. Uh, you could go to the website. We have, we have a, a tool, a policy toolkit, where you can actually um, uh, do a presentation. We have a PowerPoint there where you can, you can talk. You can, there, there are talking points there. You have to go there. There's a wealth of information uh, and become a member so when it's time for us to need people to call Congress and tell them that we need more housing, we need more funds for housing. We can count on you, at least I can, and all the people that are like me can count on you to call Congress and say, look, this is an important issue and we need fundings to fund this issue. Um, and the last one is, uh, as people become, they, they ask me, well, what more can be done? As people are starting to live longer, uh, what I think can be done is um, people can start to, to, to because uh, people are working now, uh, people that are HIV positive. And, and my idea is that maybe sometimes in the near future, we can offer uh, people that are HIV positive home ownership also. Uh, and, and, and as we get people off of Hopper and into their own homes, that would open up some slots for people who really uh, are, are trying to get to those slots. So, thanks.
So I am going to talk um, briefly about the national HIV AIDS strategy. This is something that um, the president um, fulfilled a commitment to the HIV community about a year ago by releasing. It's something that, as a candidate, the HIV community you know, went to him and said a couple things, that we need to refocus public attention on the domestic epidemic. We're doing great things, and we should all feel really proud of the way that we're literally saving the lives of millions of people around the world through our PEPFAR program, but we have to refocus attention on the domestic epidemic. But what the advocates also said was that, you know, in this PEPFAR program, our global AIDS program, we require every country to have a, a national plan. We don't have one ourselves. You know, and the, and the president agreed that, that that was right and an issue. So he tasked me and my office with, with developing this strategy. We released it last July 13th. It's the first comprehensive national plan we, we, we've had for ending the epidemic. Now, the president's always said that, you know, there's a role for the federal government, but we can't do this alone. And just to quote him when we released the strategy, he said, to accomplish these goals, we must undertake a more coordinated national response to the epidemic. And I emphasize national, not federal, but national response. The federal government can't do this alone, nor should it. Success will require the commitment of government at all levels, businesses, faith communities, philanthropy, the scientific and medical communities, educational institutions, people living with HIV and others. So really the success that we have is not about what we at the federal level do alone, it's really about what we all do collectively. Now when we look back on the first year since we implemented the strategy, I think we've, we can feel really good. Um, certainly when I look at the work of HUD and our other federal partners, we've never seen this level of activity on HIV AIDS and, and really trying to coordinate efforts across this, this um, big federal government um, than ever before. And I think that um, is beginning to pay off, but as these relationships get deeper and there's more collaborations over time, I think, I think we'll continue to, to see um, that grow. But um, I'd also say we're just beginning. Now, um, I'm not gonna go through the litany of things we did, but when we, on the anniversary of the strategy, we released a couple of things. We, did, we produced a short update implementation update, and it just shows some of the things that we think were significant over the last year, but also provides a, a direction of things we're going to be focusing on that in the coming year. We also released a short video, and it's something that we hope that people will use to engage more people, because we think there's been a lot of energy on implementing this strategy, and we're really happy with all the people that have come to the table so far, but we need to keep growing the circle, and so hopefully that'll be a useful tool. So I encourage all of you to go to aids.gov, really easy to remember, aids.gov, and you can look at the video, you can get the implementation update, you can read the strategy and all that. So I mentioned, you know, you've heard me make a couple of points already. It's not all about what the federal government does. So much of what we need to do to successfully implement the strategy depends on progress at the state and local levels. And it really depends on actions taken not only by governments but by individuals and community-based organizations. And so in addition to all of the serious policy work that is needed at the federal level, so we're not saying we're not part of the equation, but in addition to that, there's much that um, HUD and the other federal partners can do to help facilitate a dialogue at the state and local levels. They may not be in the driver's seat, they may not be making every decision, but I think we see our role as, as um, facilitating a dialogue, and that's why meetings like this are, are really important, because hopefully you'll hear some things today, both to educate you about the issue, but also hopefully you'll come away with new ideas of things that you can do to, to help us out. Um, I would say, though, that we've um, recognized this sort of broad role for communities and other stakeholders from the beginning. So just to give you a little history, when we developed the strategy, we actually held 14 community discussions all across the country. You know, in a big country, 14 isn't that many, but, you know, we tried to make a serious commitment to getting to all parts of the country, listening to as many Americans as possible. We had an online process. Community groups had meetings. Agencies had meetings. We really tried to just really listen to as many as pos people as possible. So then when we had a strategy, we could say it wasn't just by people in a room that wrote it. It was really a collective process, and hopefully we've done that. Now, at present, though, again, we need more state and local effort, efforts to implement the strategy. Um, when we put it out, we um, released it last July, the president directed lead agencies to develop detailed operational plans. So HUD and other lead agencies did that, and we released them last February. Now we're encouraging states and local governments to do the same thing. So whereas HUD has a plan, they can say, to implement the strategy, this is what HUD's going to do. We think every state should do that themselves. We think local government should do it. But even if they don't, community-based organizations can do it themselves. Now, there's been some, some debate about how to do this, and I think there's always concern, that especially people working at the state and local level, I think there's a view that they have enough responsibilities already and enough requirements from the feds, they don't want more. But I think we can, we can say we need this, but there's some principles. We shouldn't be trying to duplicate efforts. Something's already happening, we don't need to really do it. 
We're not talking about creating a new bureaucracy. You know, we're not trying to come up with new reporting systems. But what I do think would be a valuable, valuable is if the strategy itself is a roadmap. It says, these are a small number of action steps. Focus on the populations at greatest risk. At the state level and the local level, we should be looking at how, how we do all this. How do we achieve all these key action steps? How are we integrating housing programs with healthcare programs? Right? So one of the things I would task all of you with, if you're with a state and local government, I, would, I think you should think about how you can do this. But if you're not, maybe you should be pushing your uh, local governments to do it or take them out of it. Do it yourself. Maybe you could come up with your own recommendations or, or come up with ideas. Again, our point is not to say these are the 105 things we need to do, but what are the small number of strategic steps we can take? And I think that plays out what we're trying to do at the federal level, but also at the state and local levels. So I think there's really um, an important role for all of you to play. Now, faith-based and other community organizations are really critical partners in making um, the implementation of the strategy a success. Um, some of the things we've heard already, certainly um, some of Alexia's key points, are really addressing stigma and discrimination and in some cases, ignorance that uh, surrounds HIV AIDS. You know, I have to say, I've worked in HIV a long time, you know, since the, the early 90s. When I did these, you know, participated in these 14 community discussions, in some cases, it was shocking how much stigma there really is out there, how much discrimination that, that people face. You know, so we need to do something about that. And we're glad that we not only have strong partners at HUD, but Department of Justice is here. They're trying to do something about this. There's a lot of people trying to do it. But you all can help us with that. You can help us in um, a serious way uh, addressing stigma and discrimination. I think one of the things that we have tried to do um, throughout these articles and throughout, I think, MMAX Life is really work to address the role that stigma plays and continues to play in terms of people's increased risk of, infection, uh, risk of, uh, of acquiring HIV. And I think there's no better way to do an attempt to really decrease that stigma um, by, is by getting people to first stand up and say, Daniel Montoya, I am a person living with HIV and I have been for 24 years. Carolyn did it as well. And we together must begin to be able to really come forward and tell our stories. And we can only do that with the support of the community um, make, by making sure that we are doing it in a safe environment. And so that's, I think, core to what we've been trying to do in terms of some of the pieces that we've been putting out. But we've also been doing that uh, in terms of working to just do general education about HIV. We're now 30 years into the epidemic. Uh, we have a whole new generation of people who are getting infected. We have a whole new generation of people that were not around in the 80s to witness the devastating amounts of people who were dying by the droves. Um, and I think that you know we now need to educate a public that is really um, maybe a little more complacent about HIV and AIDS, that think because they can take a pill that it's not an issue. Um, and so I think that's increasingly um, concerning. Uh, faith and community leaders are critical to this discussion and to uh, addressing issues around HIV AIDS in our country and around the world. So we want to thank you for your interest, for your leadership, and for your engagement on this issue. I wanted to say a brief word about our, our office at the White House and the 13 agency faith-based centers that we coordinate. Um, Joshua Dubois sends his greeting. He runs our, our office at the White House. Our mission is very simple. It's to build and support partnerships between community and faith-based organizations and leaders and the government in order to better serve Americans in need. So we do all kinds of work around public health health with our HHS Center and work with Tim closely on HIV AIDS um, and housing and a number of other issues. Um, the, the real rationale behind the White House office uh, is also, I think, the, the reason why you as faith and community leaders are so critical to addressing um, this issue of HIV AIDS. Um, and that is the uh, critical value and importance of faith and community leaders to addressing the challenges facing all, our, all of our communities. Um, faith and community leaders are trusted. They're trusted leaders. They're trusted messengers. They know their communities well. Um, and they know, in particular, how to reach vulnerable, the most vulnerable and hard to reach in their communities. Um, before I came to the White House, I actually ran our center at HHS, so worked closely with Tim. And whether it was H1N1 flu or HIV AIDS, um, when it comes to critical 
uh, public health challenges, faith and community leaders are essential to uh, addressing health issues because they are trusted leaders, and in particular, I think because of the point David made about linking people to care. Secretary Sebelius, who was my boss at HHS, made the very important point when we first met with her, which was, look, there are community health centers, federally qualified and funded community health centers all over our country, but she meets with neighborhood groups and churches regularly who may not be linked to the very community health center that can help folks in their church and in their neighborhoods. So she charged our center at HHS and the broader initiative with making sure we were engaging faith and community leaders to say, you know, we want to make sure you know about the resources that are right down your block, and we want to make sure that folks that are vulnerable, in this case, folks uh, struggling with HIV AIDS, can link to the health resources, such as community health centers, that are already there in their neighborhoods. Um, I think Jeff is going to speak about the national HIV AIDS, first ever national HIV AIDS plan um, strategy and the implementation plan, but we were very uh, excited that the faith-based centers were lifted up in that in the implementation plan and charged specifically with working together uh, to address this issue. So I just want to ma make a point about that. Uh, we worked with uh, Tim, our White House office, the HUD Center. Um, Ter Reverend Terry Lavelle is here from the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partners. She's been part of that team. Faith-based and community organizations can help us respond to HIV in all communities. They can help us by lessening stigma, by embracing all people. But they can also, you know, they're often at the forefront of, you know, with specific populations. We know that a lot of women with HIV are juggling competing demands of keeping a roof over their heads or keeping food on the tables, and then, then they struggle to take care of themselves or do what they need to keep themselves healthy. We know that faith-based organizations provide critical support to a lot of women, women living with HIV. We definitely need to, to keep that up. I think it's safe to say that in this room, we all understand the importance of housing, and we all understand the importance of people accessing care at any level. Um, but we're in an environment where being able to do that in a way that is uh, understood in their language is something that's very important, and that's what MMAC tries to do. So one of the most important things I think I've learned in my 22 years working in public health um, is that problems as big as HIV and AIDS cannot be solved by one person or one sector alone. In fact, it takes a collaboration um, of both public, private, and nonprofit sectors coming together, people living with HIV and AIDS being a part of that conversation to ensure that together we will be able to achieve the goals of the National HIV and AIDS Strategy and see the full future in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act by 2014. Uh, I'm Alice Nickel, and as you heard earlier, I do have some extraordinarily long titles. Uh, but what you need to know about me is that I am a civil rights lawyer, and I sue people for a living, and I am extraordinarily good at it. Um, uh, so that's the, where the whole warm and fuzzy part goes out. Um, before, I, before I, and my remarks are going to be brief, but I want to thank. Uh, you know, I've been in and around the federal government as a civil rights lawyer doing uh, work on HIV and AIDS issues for like 157 years. And um, in that time, I can truly tell you I have seen the best that government can offer and I have seen the worst. And I feel extraordinarily lucky and blessed to be working in the Justice Department for Eric Holder and Tom Perez, who's the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and for a president of the United States who cares enough to talk about this issue publicly, to have an office of national AIDS policy staffed with an extraordinary staff of people who could not be more committed to these issues, and who cares enough to have a national AIDS strategy and engage the entire structure of the federal government in working on this issue. Um, so with that as background, um, what I, what I want to stress today is I want people to remember that living free of discrimination and stigma is a civil rights issue. There are still civil rights issues that are unresolved around this virus and the way that people are treated, including with respect to, although not exclusively, with respect to housing. There are three major civil rights laws that protect people with HIV and AIDS from discrimination in employment, education, the provision of uh, government services, access to medical care, the, the, the full range of things that people engage in in their lives. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act, and the Fair Housing Act, which is probably of most interest to the people in this room. 
The Justice Department, where I work, enforces all of these civil rights laws. So if you have a client who comes in and says, you know, I just lost my job, they found out I have HIV, and yes, that does still happen, although in smaller numbers than it used to, uh, that's, an act, that's a potential act of discrimination. That person needs to file uh, a complaint of discrimination against their employer, or if they're turned away from a doctor's office or a dentist's office that says, you know, I don't treat people with HIV. That's not acceptable anymore. Uh, and there are remedies within the law. I think part of the disconnect with uh, people getting to understand that, and we do think that uh, HIV discrimination is still very much underreported, is because of the use of the word disability. And people with HIV, in the absence of any other medical conditions, don't necessarily think of themselves as disabled. They think of the disabled as people who use wheelchairs, who, have, who are amputees, who are, who are disabled veterans, who are blind, who are deaf. But for legal purposes, uh, people with the virus, whether they have symptoms or not, and people with AIDS are, in fact, covered by the disability discrimination laws. Uh, and so I'm, I'm trying to get that word out. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about is with respect to housing. Well, we see a lot of discrimination in zoning. You want to build one of these housing complexes, you want to build a care facility or a medical care facility for people with HIV, you are going to likely encounter resistance within the community and the local zoning board uh, may turn down your permit. That can be a provable act of discrimination. Uh, if they're saying you can't have this kind of medical facility or housing facility here, um, because it's going to serve a population of people with HIV and AIDS, that is a potential act of discrimination if, if that is proven to be the reason. Um, the zoning issues can be addressed both under the Americans with Disabilities Act, also under the Fair Housing Act. And the only reason that makes a difference is that it makes a difference where you file the complaint. We have now made it at the Justice Department, it has never been easier to file a complaint of discrimination at the Justice Department. We have a, a dedicated web page, www.ada backslash AIDS. If you go to that web page, the second uh, click is how to file a complaint. So this is a one-click process. You go to ADA backslash AIDS, you click on complaint, you can file your complaint directly on the website with us. So we're, we're hoping that this kind of virtual access that people will now have to being able to file discrimination complaints will help us with our drill down work in trying to get the message out to people that, um, that you can in fact file uh, complaints of discrimination with the federal government. With respect to a housing issue, you file that the way you would any other kind of housing issue. You file it with HUD within 100 days. If they can't resolve it, they send it to the Justice Department housing section and those are the people that you know, engage in first negotiations and usually a lawsuit with people in order to resolve that. Um, I think our greatest challenge at the Justice Department is finding these cases at the granular, granular level. I think people who are discriminated against are still a lot of stigma associated with this virus, as there are with many other disabilities. Uh, people are engaged in trying to live their life. You lose your job. Your focus is getting another job. You can't get housing, your focus is getting housing. And this is sort of a second step focus of why this happened to you and why it's important for you to pursue this as a civil rights issue. Um, so we're, we're sort of asking for all of your help. Um, we are fully prepared. We stand, stand shoulder to shoulder every day with people who've been discriminated against. We think it's incredibly important for people to come out about that um, because of that, in part, is the remedy uh, for the persistent strain of stigma and discrimination that people uh, with the virus still face. Uh, and one of the ways to, to, to tamp down stigma, of course, is for people to, to be out about what's happened to them and to address that in some, in some public way. I want to just uh, talk about a single case of discrimination in the housing context. Uh, because I think it's important to kind of put in focus what actually ha happens to people. And this is a case from only about a couple years ago. This isn't a case from, you know, the early 80s or the late 80s or the early 90s. Uh, this is, you know, stuff that happened the day before yesterday. Um, there's uh, a 75-year-old um, man who's both a reverend and um, a doctor. And he wanted to move to Arkansas to be closer to his daughter and he needed to find a nursing home. 
Uh, and so Dr. Frank went with his daughter and looked at a number of places, found one that was acceptable to him, filled out all the paperwork, including all of his medical conditions, all the medications he's taking, all the kinds of things you have to do. There was never a problem. He moves in. The very next day, he is unceremoniously told, we didn't realize you had HIV. You can't stay here anymore. After having moved you know, his whole life across the country, um, he was represented in a, a piece of litigation by the Lam Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, who does deal LGBT issues, but also um, very much at the forefront of, of HIV discrimination issues. There was a large settlement, the terms of which uh, have not been disclosed, but I, I just want people to understand that that's very common for people to be still to be turned away from, from housing, to be turned away from nursing homes, medical care, and, um, and then sort of implore all of you to, to try and work with us um, in encouraging people to come forward and to stand up for themselves. And um, if they're willing to stand up for themselves, you know, I will stand shoulder to shoulder with each one of them. And, and together, uh, we need to engage in this fight against discrimination uh, and stigma together because that's really the only way that we are uh, going to be able to defeat it. Thank you. I heard four key things. One was this notion of stigma. I've heard that all through today, understanding and dealing with stigma. This is a major public health issue, and the stigma happens at multiple levels, institutional levels, interpersonal level, and also I'm hearing some intrapersonal, people dealing with the stigma within themselves. And certainly as public health practitioners, this is an issue that we need to be concerned about and never let get off of our, um, out of our sight in terms of dealing with it. Next, I heard strategic planning. You're not going anywhere if you don't have a plan. Get a good plan, have good partners. To have a good plan, you need education and knowledge. Find resources, find expertise. If you don't have it, locate it. You can find it for free if you make the right partners, which would be the fourth message. Key partners and relationships matter. I can't say enough how much this is like the credo to anything you're doing here is the key partnership issue. And if you have those, develop those, these other things will come. And I think the last thing is you have a hammer in the government where uh, around this issue of HIV AIDS and discrimination and don't be afraid to use it. So thank you panel and thank you audience. Over one million people have been infected with HIV AIDS in the United States and approximately 20% of the people infected do not know their HIV status. Because of HIV AIDS stigma, even people who know they are infected do not always seek medical care. Faith-based institutions are in a unique position to bring up the dialogue about HIV and fight AIDS stigma with the facts. Collaborations or partnerships between governmental, faith-based, and private sectors have proven to be effective in getting persons at risk into testing, treatment, housing, and care. HUD hopes that the information presented in this video will stimulate compassionate dialogue and action and help in affirming persons and saving lives.